Hey, hey everybody, Jason here, and I'm back with another quick video for you guys today. I'm gonna do a quick channel update and touch on a few topics that I've seen kind of floating around in the online community here lately. Behind me is my Haas Super Mini Mill 2. I'm really happy with the machine so far. Out of frame, we have a few other pieces of equipment, and I'll probably touch base on those in some future videos. If you'd ask me as a young man or a guy graduating high school or you know going into college, if I ever thought I'd find myself in manufacturing, I would have said absolutely not. But as I look back across the, I don't know, the last 10 years of my life, I wish I would have discovered manufacturing a lot sooner. I never really thought what we, I personally would be doing manufacturing. I never thought that I would be doing, and I definitely didn't think I'd be doing machining. But here we are, and I'm doing both. And uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm really, there's something very, very gratifying about dream it up, draw it up, and then, you know, drag it into existence. That, like that type of mentality, that type of process, it's very... It's just very gratifying. And so I've seen a lot of people that say, you know, I work for another company and I wanna, you know, if I could buy a machine or I'd like to buy a machine or I'd like to buy a hobby machine, I'd like to go into business for myself. And first of all, far be it for me to tell you what you should or shouldn't do with your life and I, or what you can and can't do. I have no idea. And I think that kind of, my father kind of raised me with the attitude that where there's a will, there's a way. And if you have enough passion and dedication, there's almost no limit. And so, I think you should do whatever you want to do, but it's easy to kind of romanticize how this all works. I know that I've done it a million times, and that's why I'm just sharing my story. First, it was, you know, first it was just like, oh, I want to make this product, and then I had to learn to draw it up, and that was a challenge, and then it was, you know, get it manufactured somewhere else, and even that was a challenge, and then, you know, the colossal challenge of basically going from barely knowing how to run a CNC machine, you know, just, just some basic hobby stuff, to a to having to hold very tight tolerances. It's, it's not undoable, and I think I'm living proof that, it's, that, it's, that, that anyone probably is capable of doing it if you're willing to just drop everything and commit. One of the CNC channels I really enjoy watching is Full Throttle CNC. The guy's name is Dave, and he actually makes super high-end knives. And there's so much that can be accomplished in manufacturing. It's kind of funny. Bear with me, if you will, just for a moment, but a lot of people that go into the service industry, a lot of the value that, that you kind of get from a service industry, say you hire a consultant, is it's really contingent. It's contingent value. It's not true like utilitarian style value. And here's what I mean. I, as, as, a, as an outrageous example, let's just pretend that I have a piece of paper with tomorrow's lottery numbers and it's for, I don't know, $100 million. Well, in theory, if I sold you those lottery numbers for $50 million, and you won it, you'd win 100 million, so I'd get 50 million, you'd get 50 million, we'd all win. However, if you bought that lottery ticket from me and you didn't play the lottery, I'd make 50 million dollars and you'd get, and you'd be 50 million dollars poorer, right? That value is contingent on your behavior, right? Now, on the flip side, if I had like a fork, just a good old fashioned fork that you'd pull out of your, your drawer in your kitchen, if I sold that to you for a dollar, you could use it or you could just leave it on the counter, but the value isn't gonna evaporate. It's not really contingent on its use. And if you wanted to then sell that fork to someone else, there's, there's always gonna be a need, right? And so, so there's different types of value based on kind of, kind of the circumstances of the product or the service being delivered. And one of the magical things about manufacturing is that the value kind of generally rides in the products depending on the industry you're in. It's not really contingent like say consulting services or something like that. The downside to manufacturing is that the cost to get into it can be exorbitant. And a lot of times, especially if you're new like me, you aren't experienced enough. You're just too naive to know exactly what you don't know, right? So you're too, experienced, you're too inexperienced to know how many end mills you should keep around, what style of tooling you should keep around, what kind of holders, you know, feeds and speeds. And so there's, there's, there can be a viciously steep learning curve, but once you get it figured out, you you ultimately, I don't want to say print money, but you get up every day and you can basically manufacture money each and every day and, and it's, it's not contingent, right? It's like as soon as you sell it, it's they, the, the, your customer, especially, especially if you're proud of what you're selling and you're selling something that's really high quality, I, it's, it's a very nice, it's a very good feeling. How, the, the flip side of this whole mess is that if you want to go out and do your own thing, I'm all for it. In fact, I think you should, but just, ju I, just want, I just don't want you going into, I just don't want you carrying a knife into a gunfight, I guess is what I'm saying. And the reason I use that example is I got a chance to visit a super high-end machine shop in Arizona when I was there traveling here a few weeks ago. Been, a, been about a month now. And they had multiple buildings. They had multiple buildings and multiple machines. They had a whole row of 
five axis, a whole row of four axis machines. And I mean, they're just ripping, shredding through aluminum and there's pallets and pallets of parts. And uh, you know, there was a part that was sitting there, it was kind of about the size of a Rubik's cube, you know, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. And it had a bunch of holes and features on it. And I asked the guy, I said, hey, you know, what does this go for? And he's like, hundreds of dollars, right? And so the issue that we have is that that was probably, I don't know, maybe 20 bucks in aluminum, tops, absolute tops. And this is a, you know, a part that basically has some holes and some features and stuff like that. It's not super, super sophisticated. And it's absolutely a part that probably could be ran right here behind me with like, I don't know, four or five setups. But when they put that sucker into a five axis machine, they can do it. They can literally cut that part in minutes where it would take us hours and hours and hours, not necessarily just in the machining, but more so in the setup and prep. And if you go into, if you go into the machining business, you're going if you go into the job shop business, you're competing against wolves like that. So you better know what you're doing and see, that's not me. I, after seeing that, I would never even attempt to open a job shop. And if I did, I would probably pick a very narrow niche of specific types of work that we like to do, whether it's a specific industry, specific types of cuts or specific types of metals. But I would really find something that I would try to get good at and I would focus on that. Because you will be, if you open a job shop, you will be up against guys like that. And I'm not saying there's not enough work to go around. There is tons of work. As soon as you end up with a CNC machine, people are hitting you up for all kinds of projects. The kicker is, the value, right? It's, it, all, it all comes down to the guy that needs to write the check. We've all had that buddy who he tells you that he wants to buy, you know, your car, your bicycle, what, whatever, some gadget you have. He tells you, oh man, if you ever sell it, I want to buy it. And then the minute you decide to sell it and you tell him what you want for it, he's not a buyer anymore. He's not interested anymore. Or it's, the price isn't right. And so I guess the point I'm trying to make is that ultimately people vote with their money you vote with your dollars or your customers will vote with their dollars. And so if you're going to get into machining and I think you should, it's awesome. It's very gratifying. It's a, uh, it's a very, uh, I, I don't really have a, I guess, I guess gratifying is, is it's just a very satisfying kind of career procedure process. For me, it's a little different because number one, we're a manufacturer. So we're making our own products to sell. And I think that's a much, much easier path to head down than a job shop. So if you are, have already invented something or you're making brackets or fidget spinners or whatever, doesn't, doesn't really matter. If you're making your own product and you already have a market for it and you've already sold some, then, then it's probably a far better, I mean, your, your, your level of risk is so much lower if you're going into something like this or you're gonna buy some, some industrial style, you know, capital equipment. A lot of people look at these CNC machines and they look at them like, car payments, right? This isn't like your car payment. You know, I have a, I have a car payment that's, I don't know, 650 bucks, let's just call it. If you spent that same 650 bucks on a machine, it literally could pay your mortgage if you have enough work. If you have enough of work and enough of the right kind of work, it could pay your mortgage. This is capital equipment. It's, it's, it's not really a liability in the way that you think. And so when I see people that talk about like, you know, the mismatch and comparisons between, let's just say a hobby grade mill and a, a true industrial style machine. If I had 10 grand right now, 10,000 in cash right now, and I had to have a machine and I wanted to make a product or I wanted to even do like some very niche, very narrowly focused job shop work, there isn't even a question. I wouldn't even consider any hobby machine at all ever period. I would run out and I would find a way to get my hands on some type of a VMC. Me personally, I would try to get something new that's within my kind of monthly budget range. Figure if you have $10,000 in cash, that's five, you know, 500 bucks a month for what, just under two years, that's manageable, super manageable. Or I guess it would be a thousand bucks a month for 10 months. So the issue is, that's why I say if you have the work, if you already have the work or if you already have a product and you're already selling it, then pull the trigger and get cracking. But if you're just doing this all on a whim, now that's very different. You might truly be better off just writing a check for a $10,000 hobby mill, having some fun and developing the market. And as soon as the market shows up, then, then you pull the trigger on a big VMC. So I just kind of wanted to share my thoughts a little bit. I've watched a lot of interesting videos on feeds and speeds, on the technical aspects of actually running the machines, but nobody really talks about the strategy behind whether or not to buy the equipment, Nobody tells you how many tool holders you need, how many end mills you need. You know, are you going to have employees? Like for instance, we have to pay, you know, 
We have to pay our employees, we have to pay all the taxation uh, for that. We have to pay workers' comp insurance. We have to pay for insurance on all these machines. It's easy to look past these little details and then the next thing you know, you're drowning in them. So hope you guys enjoyed watching this video just as much as I enjoyed making it and we will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.